I'm glad that we're here. We're up, we're ready, we're empowered. Uh, we've got lights, we've got sound, we've got all that. That's great. Um, we are, we're in the Bible. We're going to be going and continuing on in chapter 21. i got to tell you about chapter 21, and maybe I'll just uh, start it out by, by saying, saying the title, Even Great Pastors Can Be Wrong. I don't know if you know that. Did you guys know that? Yeah. Chapter 21 of Acts is very interesting because nearly everybody in leadership position illustrated in Acts chapter one, 21 makes a, a mistake that looks like, in light of everything, uh, probably the wrong choice. But they made the wrong choice for a lot of really good reasons. They had really good intentions, but all of the, the choices seem to be not quite in line. And it's kind of a warning. You'll see, you're getting me off. Adjusting the math. <laughs> it's like, thought I saw you. So it's kind of a warning for us, especially for those of us and leaders first, to recognize that just because God's leading you and just because you're in charge doesn't mean that you have all of the answers. And then secondarily, it means just that because God is leading you in your lives and you're, you're listening to him about a lot of things, you still have to go to him about everything. It's kind of funny. It's one of those parallel parts where on Thursdays we're going through uh, the Old Testament. We're in, in Joshua, and there's that point in Joshua right after they, the Jericho falls. They're there, and they're all happy, and they know God told them to take the land, and they look at a small village, and they're like, hey, we don't need to send a whole nation. We'll just take 3,000 folks up there, and we'll take out that, that thing. And it, said, it has this little phrase right there, very important phrase. It says, and they forgot to consult God. That's Rick's paraphrase of it, but it's essentially that's, that's what it is. And they, So did God tell them to take the land? Yeah. Yeah. So it's in, it's in general agreement with God's word. It's in, and you know, God's given them success, so they know they've got the experience, so it is a very reasonable thing for them to do. Well, sometimes we've got to sit down, and even when it's reasonable, even when it meets with the general word, we still have to sit and pray and consider and move. Does that make sense? All right. So, for example, Paul, is at the point he's getting at the end of his ministry is kind of what we're looking at we're looking at him on, on the down slope of his ministry he is an old man at this point now i don't know what an old man was he was, he was an old man i don't know if that means he's 50 45 back at this time no, i i suspect i suspect he's in his 60s at this point in the first century he was Making it past 30, you're pretty... We'll give you mature. We'll give him mature. We'll give him mature. Old enough to know better. Right. Yeah. Exactly. For me, I'm going to think he's, he's like, a, he's like a, a, a veteran at 60, which is not like other people at 60. You know, he's been... He's walked everywhere he's been. He's been beaten up. He's been... He's, so he's, he'd be like a disabled vet at 60. So his, his 60 is going to feel kind of 60. On the heavy end of 60. So he is, that's where he's at. So picking up right here, uh, Acts chapter 21, if you want to open it up, you'll see where he's at. Uh, verse 1, after saying farewell to the Ephesians, uh, to the Ephesian elders, that's what he did last week, he kind of had that, that graduation ceremony for everybody, uh, we sailed straight to the island of Kos. Uh, and the next day we reached Rhodes and then went to Petra, and uh, there we boarded a ship and sailed to Phoenicia. Uh, we sighted the island of Cyprus, passed it on our left, and landed in the harbor of Tyre in Syria, uh, where the ship was uh, to unload its cargo. Now, just kind of giving you the historical context of what, what Luke is describing here, you kind of had, even in that day, you kind of had the ships that did the milk runs, like the the port to port to port, you know, the, 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 the bus that stops at every stop, you know, that kind of thing. So he was on that bus, but he's in such a hurry to get to Jerusalem that what he does here is he jumps ship to the direct flight all the way over to Syria so they can go overland to Jerusalem because, because Paul's in such a hurry. He doesn't want to stop and go through the places he's traveled before. He made that point last time. He didn't even go to Ephesus. He just called it because he's... He's really on fire to get to Jerusalem. 
I should also add that while we're joining Paul here at this part of his journey, Paul has written by this point the book of Romans. He's written by this point uh, the Galatians, the letter to the Galatians. So all of the good, solid writings about salvation, Paul's already written. It's already in the past for him. He is as theologically developed as he's going to be at this point. He has, he has, he has done all that sort of stuff. He's, done, he's written some letters to the Corinthians. We know where he's at in all of this. Uh, and his journey is continuing. We went ashore, the we again is Paul, the, the group, and Luke, Luke's including himself in this. We went ashore, found the local believers, and stayed with them a week. The believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should, what's that say there? Interesting. These believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go to Jerusalem. When we returned to the ship at the end of the week, the entire congregation, including women and children, left the city and came down to the shore with us. There we knelt, prayed, and uh, said our farewells. We went aboard, and then they returned home. Now, uh, from Luke's accounts, this is Paul's first time to Tyre. So he shows up to a town he's never been to, and he looks for a church. This church loves on him, so much so that the, at the end of the week, these people who didn't know him seven days before are there to see him off on his journey. Isn't that amazing? And Paul is so focused on going to Jerusalem. Let me tell you, when looking at this, I, I look at this and I kept seeing these mistakes that these leaders are making. And I would go and I went to all, I went to all these commentators to see what, the, what other believers have thought about it. And I've got to tell you, commentators do so much work trying to get Paul off the hook for not listening to God right here. But I'll quote one of them right here. They said, they, well, I'll do a paraphrase of what they said. They said, well, the plainest read is that Paul disobeyed God. I think Luke wrote it as the plainest read. Now, one person points out that, well, they don't use the strong, he doesn't use the strongest knot that they could use for the not going to Jerusalem. So maybe. Now, really what they're trying to do is they're trying to protect Paul. Now, is Paul's letters that are in the Bible inspired by God? Yes. Is that scripture and important? True, 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 right? Is everything that Paul did inspired by God? No. He's just a human. As a matter of fact, I'm sure there is letters that he wrote to his mom that aren't in the Bible because they don't need to be. Because they're not. They don't carry that weight. Paul, just like anybody, can get his passion so wound up that he sometimes doesn't receive the word from God. Paul's doing. He is so excited to get to Jerusalem. Uh, last week he was saying Paul was going to Jerusalem because he wanted to get there for Passover, for the big celebration. That's what he's looking at. Now these, pope, these people, they're warning him through the Spirit. i got to tell you, and I use this quote often because it's such, it was such an important quote when I read it in, um, in seminary. Uh, there's a book written by an Anglican, uh, an Anglican missionary. I think he's a missionary monk, something. Anyway, uh, Roland Allen, written around 1906. And in that, he's talking about missionary building, uh, doing a missionary movement in Africa. And he's, uh, the title of the book, by the way, is, is kind of one of those titles that you go, I, I bet you I see where it goes. It, it's, the title of this book is Missionary Methods, St. Paul's Are Ours. Which are, right there tells you that maybe we're not doing things right. And what he says, one of those, those sentences that the Holy Spirit just zapped me with, 
was he said this. He said, we tend to trust the Holy Spirit in ourselves more than we trust the Spirit in our converts. So it's easy for Paul to do this one thing, but do these people that are giving him the message have the Holy Spirit? And they're giving him a they're giving him a message that he doesn't want to hear. But I want to go to Jerusalem. Guys, it's important. And I, I know I'm going to say several times about how the leaders are failing here in this. But, but hear this. This is a warning not only to leaders. This is a warning to everybody in every era element of there. That first of all, you have an ownership in my life as well. That just because on Sunday I stand up here at the pulpit and start talking, that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's not talking to you as well. Which is one of the reasons why we all, we all speak into each other's lives. That's what's supposed to happen. And what's supposed to happen is the person up here is still supposed to be pliant enough to listen and recognize that my passions may be pointing me in the wrong direction and I have to receive the Holy Spirit, both externally and internally. The next stop after uh, leaving Tyre, oh, I love Tyre. Okay, so I don't want to leave Tyre yet, so I'm going to stop here. Tyre is one of those cities that Jesus had even talked about. Remember, it, he had mentioned that if, if the miracles that were done in Jerusalem or in, in, in Capernaum, right? If they had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they said the whole city would have turned around. What do we see right here? We see, it. we see what the church ought to look like. But Paul's vision is to go to the Holy Land. To go to God's people, the Jews in Jerusalem. Where he thinks the center of the faith is. But he just walked right by the center of the faith. In a sense, he's, he's almost leaving the kingdom to go to the place where he thinks the kingdom's at. The next stop after leaving Tyre uh, was uh, Ptolemus, where we greeted, uh, we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed for one day. The next day we went on to Caesarea. Caesarea is kind of like the capital of that area, that, that greater area. And uh, stayed at the home of Philip the Evangelist. Do you remember this guy from earlier? One of the seven men who had been chosen to distribute food. He had, married, he had four unmarried daughters who had the gift. Take a, take a second to mention this. Um, I think Luke is, is warning us. Uh, why, did, why was Philip chosen to, uh, to work with food? Do you remember? Because there was a split within the church. The real Jews weren't taking care of the Hellenistic Jews. So Philip, another cat by the name of Stephen, were picked, picked to be deacons to help settle that. Stephen is then executed by men of which Paul was one. He approved of. So we see kind of this, God's kind of brought these two men who have done life in different directions. Philip was eventually driven out of Jerusalem by persecution. Now what did he do when he left Jerusalem? He witnessed in Samaria. He witnessed in, to some random guy, some random Ethiopian that was out there. He was an evangelist. He took the message. He followed the Great Commission with his life outside Jerusalem. And here he is there. Uh, we see that his daughters are even pastors. Who wait, I don't know what they say that. Prophetism. Empowered to say, thus saith the Lord. I think we gotta remember that, that that thing, I think Paul, I think Luke, when he's writing this down, wants us also to remember that that split's going on. Because guess what's still happening? That same split. That same split is still in the heart of the church in Jerusalem. Several days later, a man named Agabus, 
Agabus was uh, somebody that also had traveled with Paul before. So we're seeing some, some kind of a blast from the past, all kind of in, uh, who had the gift of prophecy, yet another prophet, arrived from Judea. And he came over and took Paul's belt and he bound it, his own feet and hands with it. He's doing what uh, Jeremiah did, where he did the, where putting the yoke and kind of did the, he's doing one of those kind of prophets. I don't want to say church drama because that almost feels, what's that? Performance prophecy. Performance prophecy, yeah, it's, it is. It, 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 uh, so he bound, uh, he bound his own feet and hands with it. Then he said, the Holy Spirit declares, uh, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to Gentiles. When he heard this, we and the other local believers all begged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. So like I said, what a lot of people really want to do is they want to turn around and suggest that Paul is the uber Christian and he's not making a mistake. And they'll read this in such a way, such a light that says that really it's their compassion for Paul that is trying to get him to, to forsake his mission. And you know what? I'd almost believe with them. I would almost ride with them except for that earlier verse. That earlier verse that deliberately says, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Um, you know, there was one person, one prophet that had pointed out this. I'm uh, sorry, one of the translators, uh, one of the commentators, had made the, the, the statement, and I really like it. They said that that first prohibition of God, uh, Paul from going to, to there really almost, almost also reads uh, like, stop going to Jerusalem. And I sat down, I thought about it, and I said, you know what, I think that there's a, a strong truth to this, because really what Paul is doing here is he's trying to keep Jerusalem as the head of the church. He's trying to keep Jerusalem as, as the organizational head of the church. It may have even been a mistake earlier when, remember, the, the, the problem that they were having, they had men from Jerusalem come out and cause a problem in one of their churches about Gentiles being believers, even after the Holy Spirit had empowered them. So what happened is, is the Gentile church sent Paul and some other people to Jerusalem to say, well, what are we supposed to do? Again, giving Jerusalem the power to choose what the right thing to do is. And Jerusalem at that point wisely decided that they're just going to side with whatever God does. In other words, God must have accepted them. So Gentiles are believers. But they don't have to adhere to the law, is what they said. Don't eat blood. Refrain from sexual immorality. But when we see here Paul's drive to go to Jerusalem, I'm telling you, uh, he has just written a book of Romans, so we know exactly why Paul wants to go to Jerusalem. He wants to go to Jerusalem because of Romans chapter 9. In Romans chapter 9, he straight up says, if I could give away my salvation to save my nation, I would. If only it was that easy. He wants to go to save his family. His family is lost, and he's like, if I just go there, in my strength, I know they'll convert. Because I've got all the right words now. However, previously, he had been in Jerusalem, and, and God had told him not to be in Jerusalem, to head out. Here, as he's, he's on that headlong run in there, God's put up a promise, don't go. But he is so, now, now, is it a good thing to want your family to be a believer? Is it a good thing for you want your nation to be a believer? These are all good things for him to want. The thing is, they weren't his mission. Ah, see, that's a that's an interesting thing. Um, I think we see here the truth that that there's a lot of things that we don't do that that uh, that don't do according to what God would have us plan, but He still uses. The easiest example is when somebody has a uh, has a divorce or has a 
as prison time in their past. And then they turn around and say, you know what, God used that time in prison to shape me. Well, that didn't mean that God wanted you to rob the bank. That makes sense? And really what we're seeing is we see a change. And let, let's look here. But he said, this is what Paul, how Paul responds, why are you weeping? You are breaking my heart. I am ready not only to be jailed in Jerusalem, but even to die for the sake of the Lord. When it is clear that we couldn't persuade him, we couldn't persuade him, he wasn't listening, we. Luke is also part of the group saying, don't go, Paul. We gave up and said the work will be done. I got to tell you, what I believe here is what happened is this is that point where, and sometimes the warning that God gives us moves from if you do this to when you do this. Paul's dead set on doing this. Okay, when you do this, you're going to get jailed. Now, is it true that he was going to be executed? Yes. Was martyrdom going to happen? Does he get executed in Jerusalem? He goes to Rome to get executed. Interesting, right? And he writes in the book of Romans, even, even when he's like, I'm going to Jerusalem, he goes, I really want to be in Rome. That's where I'm supposed to go, so I'm hoping I can get there. And we look at it, we go, oh, how great it is that God gets him all wrapped up and arrested and ends up taking him to Rome. Whereas had he just gone to Rome, he could have taken the boat the other direction. But he doesn't, because his desire to save this, this is such that he's not, I don't think he's clearly received it. But, back to us. There are times in my life where I think I've made the wrong choice, but God still used it. Or you can make the wrong commitment, and God still used it. God does honor our choices. And just because we make a wrong choice doesn't mean he's going to stop using us. Let me tell you this. So, Paul, let me, let me fast forward. In a couple weeks, Paul is going to be uh, arrested in Jerusalem. And he's going to be drugged. So he just left Caesarea to go to Jerusalem. He's going to be arrested in Jerusalem. They take him from Jerusalem. And he's going to go speak to the governor. Where do you think, Anna? That's the real. He's not even going to be able to speak in Jerusalem like he wants to speak in Jerusalem. There's a, there's a similarity here to Jonah getting on the boat and going the wrong way from Nineveh. So God tells him to go to Nineveh, and instead of going to Nineveh, he goes, instead of going east, he goes west. Now, does God use Jonah to witness to the sailors on the boat? Yeah, God still uses them. But I guarantee you, Jonah would have had a much better time had he just gone straight there. As a matter of fact, there's this, there's this one statement where he's, where he's witnessing to the governor, and it's just kind of this little phrase, it's like, you, you know, and there's almost this uh, this phrase about him being in chains. You know, if only I wasn't in chains at this point. And it's interesting because he would have said the exact same things just with, without chains. And you're like, man, you probably could. Philip probably could have walked you over to the building four weeks ago with fewer bruises. Sometimes we do that. Our, our passion is to, to do this one thing. After this, we packed our things and left for Jerusalem. Some believers from Caesarea accompanied us, and they took us to the home of uh, Nan uh, Nansa, a man originally from Cyprus and one of the early believers. So again, we're seeing this, this kind of play, play through of, of the gospel having moved out from Jerusalem. And he goes from place to place, and it's continually we're seeing believing community, believing community, and all of them are welcoming and loving and then he's walking here, and he says, uh, and, and uh, when we arrived, the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem welcomed us warmly. So the whole church has this big welcoming ceremony. Now, i got to tell you, there's also another parallel, that there's also kind of, this is almost like Paul's triumphal entry. 
there's another kind of pattern that follows here too. Shows up to Jerusalem and it sounds like a big old party. The next day, Paul went with, uh, with us to meet with James and all the elders, the pastors of the Jerusalem church were present. After greeting them, Paul gave a detailed account of these things. I'm sorry, of the things that God had accompanied or had accomplished among the Gentiles through his ministry. Now, this is kind of in, in the in the language, uh, my understanding is he's giving us this is this is like the idea of giving a very detailed report. He's kind of giving an itemized list. And he's giving the list to them because in Paul's mind, Jerusalem is the head of the church. So he's coming back, and he's going back to his denominational headquarters. Because he figures, well, they sent me, they sent me to Antioch. So, and then from Antioch, I went here, and I ended up in Ephesus. So he's going back to his, what he thinks is kind of his sending agency. They don't see it that way, but he does. He's giving his report. Their response is this. After hearing this, they praise God. Would that sentence ended right there? And then they said, You know, dear brothers, how many thousands of Jews uh, have also believed, and all the all the and they all followed the law of Moses very seriously. So really what they're, they're pointing out is, is what they're receiving from, from Paul is there's a whole lot of Gentiles that, that are believers. And they're not rejoicing, they're not truly rejoicing that they're Gentile believers. They're reminding them that, hey, there's Jewish believers too. Well, we got thousands here too. We're good too. We're a good church too. Paul isn't there to say, I'm better than you because we've got thousands of believers. He's there to say, look at what your ministry has done. You're a witness to the nations. You're a blessing to the world. That's what Abraham's promise was. It's lived out here. But the Jewish believers here in Jerusalem have been told that you're teaching all the Jews who live among the Gentiles. There's the problem also that the Jews love live among Gentiles, to turn their backs on the law of Moses. They heard that you are teaching them not to circumcise their children and to follow other Jewish customs. What should we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. This is the same fight, this is the same nationalistic fight, the same racist fight. Same one that, that caused Philip to have to respond. This civil war has been going on for decades in the Jerusalem church. And it's coming out here. It really Paul gets the, hey, you're doing you're doing great, but how what you're 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 telling me that there are Gentile believers, that's gonna make the people here that don't like Gentiles upset. Let's figure out a way to make the people that don't like Gentiles happy the leadership this is the leadership of the church is now making this choice that is not a good choice again I told you in this chapter we see Paul making some choices that aren't right now we see James making some choices that aren't right hey James is that James is the writer that he's going to write faith without works is dead is that true that's absolutely true but he's confusing the wrong kind of works in here. He's thinking the observing of the law is the works. What about loving your brother? Where is that fruit? These people, he says, look, the fruit of their faith is that they're observing the law. I say the fruit of their faith is they're hating their brother. That's, that's pointing to not the right fruit, not the right faith. Here's what we want you to do. We have four men here who have completed their vow. Go with them to the temple and join them in their purification ceremony, paying for them to have their heads ritually shaved. And, uh, then everyone will know that the rumors are all false and that you yourself observe the Jewish law. Now really, we can argue this. Hey, remember in, in, in Romans chapter 14, Paul makes that weaker, stronger uh, argument. So maybe Paul trying to help out the, the weaker folks. And I gotta tell you, there's a there's a truth to the fact that 
Also, Paul in uh, in First Corinthians chapter nine, he says to the G, the Greek, I'm Greek, to the Jew, I'm a Jew, and all things to all men, so that by all possible means some are saved. In other words, when he goes to a Jewish house, he acts Jewish. When he goes to a Greek house, he acts Greek because he tries to build the to, to, to show the gospel. That's what Paul has said, 1 Corinthians. So here you're like, hey, let's just not stumble these non-believers, except there's a problem. The problem is the pulpit is making this decision, and what they're doing is they're saying it doesn't really matter. Salvation, so, salvation is either Jesus or the law, and we're not going to make a call. But that's not good. Josie, I love your, your illustration talking about there's a thing that happens, like individually we have to make a choice, and we'll use with, just because the mask thing is a it's an easy it's an easy parallel. Individually, you can figure out because of who you're staying with or who you're around, whether or not you're gonna uh, adhere to the mask rules to, to show love to, to somebody that's more concerned about it. There's a there's a truth about that. At, at a low level, at a brother's brother's level. But then there's a spot where at, as a pulpit, at the church you have to make major declarations. I said this, I, I said this statement, it was fairly inflammatory, luckily we're far enough again in, in FaceTime Live that I'm sure almost nobody's gonna watch this video, so we'll be okay. I made the point of the churches that had closed their doors to Sunday service, but it continued to keep their food pantry open. And I said, while it sounds great and wonderful, you just told your community what bread you think is more important. By Paul doing this, he is saying that, that we need to kill animals to be saved. He thinks he's trying to make things nice. He thinks he's trying to be a man of peace. He's going to make the, he's going to make a mistake. We're going to see the fruit of that decision. As we told the Gentile believers, they should do what we already told them in the letter. They should abstain from eating uh, food offered to idols, uh, from consuming animals or the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. Which all sounds great, but I got to tell you, it betrays the heart of their decision there. And that's the idea that there's a second class status for Gentile believers in the Church of Jerusalem. They should just sit down and be happy where they're at. Don't go to the temple, don't do any things, just do that. You know, here's your crayons, be happy. Whereas the mission, when, when, when Paul is teaching, and even in Romans, he says now we're all one family of Christ. All together. When he's making that distinction, Jerusalem Church is not making that distinction. They're saying, it's okay we have a black meeting after the church. All the black people can go do that, and they can go do black things. How wrong is that? Is that God's picture of his family? But it's so institutionalized, the pastors are doing it because they don't want to cause problems. If we do it this way, nobody will fight, nobody will be mad. Well, what we have is we have the Gentile believers and we have the real people of God, right, that are still adhering to the law. That's really what they're saying. So Paul went to the temple the next day, and went with other men. They were already uh, started their purification ritual, so they publicly announced the date when their vows would end and sacrifices would be offered for them. So first of all, again, the question in my head, why are they offering sacrifices? Why is the animal dying? What's paying for your sin? What's purifying you? Burning your hair is purifying you? It's at this point, while Paul's doing this, he's the, he's saying he believes something in his actions. He's making a declaration that's counter to his real belief, just to make things right. The seven days were almost ended when some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul in the temple. And they roused the mob against him. They grabbed him. They yelled, Men of Israel, help us. This is the man who preaches against our people everywhere and tells everyone, everybody to disobey the Jewish laws. He speaks against the temple. He even defiles this holy space by bringing Gentiles. From early 
earlier that day, or earlier that day, they had seen him in the city with uh, uh, Troph Trophimus, a, a Gentile from Ephesus, and they assumed Paul had taken him in the temple. It's like, you know, he hangs out with those people. Those people. Where's the fruit of Christ in this? Now, I do say this, these, these people that are bearing false witness are hitting pretty, pretty doggone close to the truth. Why go to the temple? To see an animal killed? Jesus Christ, Christ died on the cross. Pay for your sin. To speak God's word? Man, he went from community to community that was sharing God's word and living it out together. The kingdom was there in Caesarea. It was there in Tyre. He had men that were the had a church family in Ephesus that he didn't even stop to see because he was in such a hurry to get to Jerusalem. It was. And what we're going to see here is we're going to see this. This is kind of the ending of the I'll tell you, after this, the, the church in Jerusalem has very little impact on it. This is it. This right here is the last time we see the church of, of Jerusalem being the driving force in Christianity. We're not going to see them again in Acts. With the exception of accusers are going to come from this area. We don't even see Peter here in Jerusalem. Peter's already in Rome. After this point in, in Christian history, you're going to see the church emerge in two places. One around Constantinople and one around Rome. The whole city was rocked by accusations. And a great riot followed. Paul was grabbed and dragged out of the temple, and immediately the gates were closed behind him. That picture is very much just like we talked about how Jesus had, had preached at the temple, but Jesus' preaching at the temple was one of judgment. How this was an empty place. And his death tears the veil between God and, and the people. At that point, the, te the temple's nothing. It's just a place where there's a bunch of people. It's a good place for people to, to meet if, if you want to meet people. The whole city was rocked with, uh, by the accusations of the great right following. Paul was grabbed and dragged out of the temple, and immediately the gates were closed <gasps> behind him. As they were trying to kill him, word reached the commander of the Roman regiment that all of Jerusalem was in a row uproar. He immediately called out his soldiers and officers and ran down uh, among the crowd. When the mob saw the commander of the troops, they stopped beating Paul. And you do see that picture I was saying, that, that picture of him. The church closing, the temple closing its doors. When the commander arrested him and ordered him bound with chains, he asked the crowd what he was, uh, who he was, and what he had done. Some shouted one thing, some shouted another, since he couldn't find out the truth, it was all in an uproar and confusion. He ordered that Paul be taken um, to the fortress. As Paul reached the stairs, the mob grew so violent that the soldiers had to lift him on their shoulders and to protect him. And the crowd followed behind him, shouting, kill him, kill him. So you saw almost, this is a week, a little over a week, a week and a day, after his great, wonderful reading. And there is a, you had mentioned uh, the parallel to Christ. There's almost a parallel here. The same group of people among the same group that warmly welcomed him at the beginning are amongst that crowd that are following him. Kill him, kill him. Kill him, kill him. It sort of breaks your heart. It certainly broke Paul's heart. Now, next week, we're gonna get, he's going to get one chance to make an address. And we're going to see what's going to happen with the address. But uh, we'll talk about that. When we look at this for us, we got to remember that, that, and I'll say it like this, I may be blinded by my, own, by my own intentions, good intentions, 
by my own passion. Therefore, we, we all must do this, because I, because I individually, because you individually, because we all individually can fly that way. That's why it's important that we speak into each other's life. We own a little piece of that life. That's why we need to be, be, be ready to sacrifice whatever plan that we sit down and we say, this is my plan, thus saith Rick. We need to lay it out in such a way so that when, if the Holy Spirit leads us or leads other people to come in and say, hey, this is not it. We should be able to, to take it out. And, by the way, that also means we should be invested and prepared to speak into the lives of other believers and prepared to hear from. Because, I did that, this lesson isn't just for leaders, all of us. Within the community of God, that's, that's the... God lives in the community of the believers. That's important. The Holy Spirit gives us all pieces of the puzzle so that we can all work together. What an amazing work we do when we work together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you that, that you have never left us, uh, that, that even when our passions uh, get so much so that we are leaning over our skis, Lord, that you have other believers in our lives to come in and speak to us. Lord, we pray that we have the courage to listen to those people and to be right on the bubble. We, Lord, that we're so grateful that even when, when sometimes we make mistakes, like, like I believe Paul made mistakes or James made mistakes, that even when that happens, that you're not done working with any of them, that you continue to work through humans even after their zealousness or their over-eagerness or their passions uh, uh, get them out of, out of whack. Lord, we pray that if our passions get us out of whack, or as soon as that happens, that you uh, you help correct us, you help put us in the right direction, so that we can be that we can be your community, your hands and feet here on this earth. That we can show love to our, our brothers and sisters. Lord, when we look at this story, help us look like the church in Tyre. Help us look like the, the church in Caesarea. Help us look like the church in Ephesus as it's uh, leaning and loving with one another. And Lord, I thank you for a, a community of believers that are all empowered by the Holy Spirit. We thank you for all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And the last thing I tell you is your blessing. I pray the Lord bless you, that he keeps you, that he makes his face to shine upon you, that he's gracious to you, and he grants you peace. Amen.